Hello and welcome to Stow Talks, a series of videos designed to support people going through a relationship breakdown and all of the challenges this brings. I'm Matthew Taylor. And I'm Lisa Gatchell, family lawyers at Stowe Family Law. And in each episode, we bring in some of the amazing professionals we work with so they can share their advice and expertise on a range of issues from co-parenting to financial advice to dealing with challenging ex-partners. Today, we're joined by Dr. Sue palmer Con, one of the UK's leading divorce coaches, as we explore the challenges faced by women if their relationship breaks down during the menopausal years and share some practical tips on rebuilding confidence, taking back control and gaining strength and independence. Known as the Divorce Doctor, Sue is a highly experienced and specialist divorce coach. She works with people going through a relationship breakup, providing emotional support during divorce and separation, helping them forge a happier future. She is a certified divorce coach, certified divorce specialist, chartered psychologist, and has a PhD and MBA. A best-selling author, Sue has written three best-selling books, five book chapters, and more than 100 journal articles. Having gone through her own divorce at 50, Sue specialises in supporting women over 40 through a relationship breakdown so they can move forward in life from a position of renewed strength. Welcome, Sue, and thank you for joining us on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Menopause can have a detrimental effect on so many areas of women's lives. From your experience, how have you found that menopause has affected relationships? Well, I mean, menopause itself is an all-encompassing part of life for women, sort of of 45 to 55 mainly. And I don't know whether it's coincidental or whether it's as a, a, a cause and effect, but the highest number of divorces in women is at 45. So, you know, who knows what, whether it's cause or effect, but it is so all-encompassing and, you know, there's mental as well as physical symptoms. Could you, I mean, this might sound like a really silly question, but can you go through some of the symptoms that the menopause does bring about? Well, physical symptoms, obviously, you know, the as the hormones decrease, then you get things like weight gain, moodiness, um, am I allowed to say vaginal dryness? Yeah, say whatever you want. (laughs) Sore breasts, hot hot flushes, night sweats. You know, none of those are really good for having a, a good relationship. And when you are speaking to a client who comes to you and is going through a relationship breakdown around that time of life, experiencing some of those symptoms, are they conscious that the relationship breakdown might be linked to the menopause, the perimenopause, or is that something that you tend to explore through your sessions with them? Often they're not. Very often they don't even realise that they're in the perimenopause st- stage. It's only when they start talking about their mood swings, the brain fog, as well as all the physical symptoms, that they start putting two and two together. Very often, you know, it might be one of the kids saying, oh, you're so moody. And, you know, they then start thinking, well, perhaps something's happening. Mm. But, you know, the, the, the brain fog and the moodiness can be an added problem on top of the physical elements of, of menopause. You know, who wants to be with somebody that's shouting one minute and weepy the next? And, and what age can these symptoms typically start? Normally, it's any age after about 40, but the average age is between about 45 and 55. Although, you know, some people do go through an early menopause earlier than 40, and some people might have even a a surgical menopause. How does a surgical menopause start? What, 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 What sort of surgery might that relate from? Well, if they've had a hysterectomy, if they've had a full hysterectomy where the ovaries have gone, then obviously there's no no estrogen progesterone producing elements in the body so they go immediately into menopause symptoms and how long do the symptoms tend to last um average is about six to eight years but it can be anything up to 10 or 12 years wow it's like a life sentence (laughs) (laughs) So we, we talk a lot about relationship breakdown and the effect that the menopause could have on that. But for people that are still working on their relationship and are getting these symptoms, what things can they do to help themselves and what things can their partners do to help them during this time? Oh, education, education, education. They need to learn about the symptoms. 
they need to learn about the effects that it can have. Just talking is better than nothing. Um, you know, so many people are too embarrassed to go to their doctors. You know, they think there's, a, you know, they're, they're not going to get treated sympathetically because there's a lot of GPs even that don't fully understand menopause symptoms. And they go there and they're very often offered something like antidepressants or anxiety pills or whatever. And that's not what they want. You know, if they, if the HRT patches especially are really good now, mm -hmm. they are low oestrogen progesterone, not, not like they were in my mum's day when she had them. Because there can be a lot of bad press around the HRT, can't there? I mean, yeah. I know from speaking to my own mum, she was really reluctant to even consider something like that. As you say, they've changed quite a bit. So that's yeah. something that women should really be thinking about a little bit more, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because, it, you know, there's, it's, it's a complex mix of hormones. We all know about the drop-off in oestrogen and progesterone but there's also a drop off in testosterone and we think that as a, a male hormone but women have it as well and it's responsible for fall off in libido so as well as everything else you know oh I really don't feel like it and they're not making an excuse mm. they just don't have the drive anymore do you think there's um, an element of stigma involved I think traditionally the menopause wasn't spoken about no and as a man my knowledge of the menopause is like minuscule it's pathetic and i think part of that is due to lack of conversations about it and stigma and you know it was the change do you think that is changing now when people are starting to it's starting to become a bit more openly talked about um yes it is you know there's a, a paper gone through parliament so that you know all workplaces are now supposed to have a menopause policy in the same way as they have pregnancy and maternity policies. Mm. But not every workplace is making the right sort of allowances. They might just put a fan in the office. But do they give flexible working? Do they allow people to, to take breaks when they need to? Because, you know, the brain fog can make all sorts of problems in the long term as well as the short term. So if somebody's thinking at the moment, I, you know, I've, I've got some of these symptoms, I just can't cope, what should I do? I know you said that research and, and gaining knowledge is, is the, the first thing that you should be looking to do, but where do they get that from? Is it their GP or are there online resources that they should be looking at, particularly books? I know you've got your own books and I'm sure they would be great um, for people to read, but is there something specific as a first stop that you would recommend for people? There's so much information online um, you know, Louise Newson has got a clinic, which is absolutely fantastic. She's written a really nice, handy, sh short book, which I would advise anybody to read, male and female. There's tips for, for them. There's tips for teenagers, how to cope with a moody mum. So, you know, that, that gives a lot of information. She talks about relationship in there, but not specifically about how to cope with menopause and divorce at the same time. So moving on to talking about relationship breakdown specifically, what do you think are the key factors or considerations that maybe apply to women going through menopause symptoms at a time of divorce or relationship breakdown that are maybe more heightened at that time than at another time in their lives? Well, I mean, as, as well as the physical symptoms, the brain rewires itself. So pre-menopausal, you've got this soft mummy brain, try to avoid arguments, care for everybody. During menopause, the brain unwires that mummy brain and the I'm myself brain plugs itself in and no longer are they willing to take the mess from everybody. No longer are they happy to look after a third child in terms of their husband. <laughs> you know, if he's not going to pull his weight, he can pull it pull himself away <laughs> I mean I feel like this is a positive that we're getting out of it <laughs> so there's all sorts of things to consider you know we need a little bit of empathy not sympathy we don't want sympathy but we do need empathy we need people to understand that we're not making excuses you know headaches are real brain fog is real I went through a phase where 
I would introduce, go to introduce people and think, oh my God, I can't even remember the person's name in the next office. So in terms of the brain fog, that's got to be quite difficult in going through a relationship breakdown. Because if you're dealing with divorce and maybe you're trying to sort out the finances on divorce, it's not entirely straightforward. There's no. tons of information. What If someone's experiencing those symptoms and really struggling to kind of focus on what they need to do because of these underlying biological things, what, what tips are there available for, for women to cope with that and to be able to deal with the process in the best possible way? Don't rush it. Do it when you feel at your best. But on the other hand, there's so many women whose brain fog and moods are so bad that sometimes they have to give up work. So thinking long term, how are they going to be looked after? They might, might have had a high power job which they can no longer cope with. How are they going to cope after divorce when they haven't got that income? So this needs to be taken into account You know, when, when you're looking at spousal maintenance. It may not be forever. It, well, it won't be forever because, you know, the brain fog does this, mm. does finish at some point. It's a difficult one, isn't it? Because I think when we're dealing with clients, particularly in the, you know, the current climate, we're looking to achieve independence. Mm. And if anything, we're looking to um, increase earning capacities and increase hours where perhaps previously they were caring for children and working part time, etc. And then obviously we're talking about now how actually for women... Whilst, you know, it might be that we can say, all oh, the children are at school now, so you can go out and you can work yeah. more. There might be other factors that need to be taken into account. Yeah. So yeah. that is really interesting. We very often menopause co- co-occurs with empty nest syndrome or elderly parents. So mm. the empty nest, yes, you can go out and work more. Elderly parents, they may call on their time. Mm. But it, it is the fact that so many feel that they can't carry on working to the same level that they did during that period. It'll finish, you know, they'll be able to go back to work eventually. But, you know, the thing that I always encourage people to do when they, when the, their relationship is breaking down, think about it. Is menopause exposing a, a fundamental underlying problem or is it just due to hormones? If it's just due to hormones, they can be helped through it. Mm. And, and how, how do you think they can get to that? How do you think they can work out whether there is a fundamental underlying issue or it's the hormones and it's, it's a temporary, albeit quite a long temporary change? What's the, how do you work with clients to, to help them kind of work that out? As, as well as being a, a divorce coach, I'm also a discernment counsellor. So I work with couples on a short-term basis and, you know, we look at the reasons why relationships are breaking down is it something that we can find a solution to is it something that they can work on long term the discernment counseling is just five sessions at the most so they come in and what they're trying to do is understand the you know the the clarity and and build the confidence in the decisions that they're going to make so we're trying to get them to to make informed decisions rather than emotional knee-jerk decisions. Because, you know, people are so emotional when they're going through menopause that they might say things that they regret, they might do things that later they'll regret. And just with a little bit of help and guidance, they can overcome most of these obstacles. I mean, as we saw from the the results of the the Stowe survey, 80% of people survive their marriage, although more than half of them were worried about the long-term effects of, of the relationship. And as long as, you know, there hasn't been, a lo- you know, irretrievable breakdowns, mm. then we can help them to overcome the obstacles. So when they're doing this discernment counselling, they, they have three paths that they can choose. The first one is to carry on as they are, which very few people choose. The second one is, you know, let's go through a a divorce but let's make it as healthy and amicable as we can and the third one is let's try and solve these problems and take up some long-term marriage guidance it's interesting because one of the um one of the big reasons that sometimes we see within divorces is lack of sexual lack of sexual contact and therefore feeling unloved 
by yeah. their partner but obviously you know you've given some really good examples of why actually that it's not the case that they're not loved it's the case that there are other things potentially going on if you're going through the menopause and you're that you're in that period of your life um so it's yeah it's a really interesting uptake on it and almost it's the partners in some respect that need that education mm. as yeah. well so that they can understand that it's not them it's not about you know their partner not loving them or not wanting to be intimate with them but actually it's you know there's a lot going on in the background and how they can support them through that yeah I mean you think about it you're going through all these hormonal changes and I won't say it's inevitable but so many people do start putting on weight during menopause and you feel less attractive in fact you feel totally horrible unattractive not less attractive you know how can anybody love me looking like this and it's that feeling of inadequacy that then start, you know, they start pushing mm-hmm. them, up, pushing people away. If you can't love yourself, how can anybody else? There must be huge self-esteem issues. Oh, huge. And especially huge. if you're talking about women who are either, it, it, it strikes me there's probably a fair number of women who probably feel their purpose has changed or gone in life. If they can't work because of the brain fog or children have left home, if they've, if they've been at home as the primary care with the children, yeah. it's got to be a huge kind of impact on your self, self-esteem with that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I hadn't worked for 20 years. You know, oh, well, I'd, I'd worked very part-time. I took seven years off until the youngest one started school. And then for the next 13 years whilst they were in school, I only worked very part-time because they were doing so much sport, you know, they needed transporting Mm. around. And so when I got divorced, I then had to think, how am I going to support myself? And I had just finished doing a PhD because my self-esteem was so low going through the menopause. I thought, well, I've got to do something to boost it. Unfortunately, or unfortunately, that was one of the causes of, of divorce because I was now more qualified <laughs> and male ego took a bruising <laughs> i can't imagine that for a second <laughs> but then i got um offered a job i did my phd at manchester and i got offered a job as a junior lecturer and in five years i went from junior lecturer to dean of a faculty so ooh, mm. all of a sudden financial independence more bruised ego bye-bye um i feel like hormones have a lot to answer for as well because (laughs) some of the things that you were just talking about there i can relate to as far as pregnancy and um post-pregnancy that those those rises and those dips and the the, you know the weight gain the feeling less attractive the lack of self-esteem all of those things um i feel like as women we get the short straw (laughs) in some of this yeah i mean the thing is no arguments here on on that (laughs) the thing is that Related to the progesterone and oestrogen, there's also the the other hormones, but, you know, I say dose of happiness hormones, the dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, um, epinephrine, and, you know, they're all the, the positive things. Well, they're dropping off as well. Mm-hmm. However, you know, when we talk about lack of libido, lack of sex and things like that, loving somebody and having physical touch is not always down to having sex you know holding hands will boost oxytocin and that will bring back some of the the more lovable elements just a hug yeah just a hug <laughs> love so, a hug so <laughs> everyone loves a hug everyone needs a hug yeah. um so what other things can be can people do to boost the kind of the happiness hormones the the, the serotonin the, the... yeah exercise that, that's a, that, that must and be we don't mean going though. to the gym do we for like three no, hours no, we just no. mean a walk just, just <laughs> a walk <laughs> you know I, I, my apartment overlooks the sea and I go out for a walk and I come back and I feel completely different I can go out feeling dead miserable because I've mm-hmm. had a mm. you know loads of marking to do or anything like that come back and I feel right okay I can face the day again so just a, a, a walk in the fresh air meeting up with friends Taking up, you know, doing things that are going to relax you, you know, meditation, things I, like that. I find that. it quite interesting that you said that when you were going through it, you started doing the PhD. I can think of a few things that would be less relaxing, but there must also be some huge benefits 
in terms of that feeling of achievement. So what, yeah, what well, made you decide, decide to start to do that and how did that impact you? I just you? felt totally inadequate because, you know, I'd lost... You know, I'd always had a, a really good sex drive and pff, suddenly, stay away. Mm. And I needed my self-esteem boosting. And what better than, you know, people saying, oh, wow, you've, you've done that? You know, all of a sudden... You know, I, I, you know my, when I met up with my ex after a few years, he, he said, Miss or Mrs. And I said, no, I'm doctor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. I'd love that. That <laughs> yeah. is like the, the ultimate mic drop. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Put down. <laughs> as, as if that fragile male ego wasn't already bruised <laughs> yeah. enough. Oh, that's, yeah, oh, I love that. Funnily enough, he got his own PhD. At, oh, really? Oh, yeah. yeah. But he actually sent me his... Um, draft to read to check all his stats and everything because I'd actually written his first um, questionnaire for him and oh, wow. I'd been teaching him how to do all the stats because as a dentist he was more you know sort of hands-on rather than brain engaging with the numbers and uh, people said to me didn't you do you know tell him things were right when they were wrong and I said no, <laughs> no I, th- I th- think nice that's, that, that's very good of you not to kind of stoop to those levels but <laughs> it, it, it must speak volumes as to the relationship that you maintained with your ex following the divorce obviously it must have been a difficult time but if you can do that afterwards what what's the secret to be able to to, to do that to maintain some somewhat sort of amicable res- mutual respect relationship after a divorce Well, I think you've got to remember that you're always going to be parents together and Mm -hmm. grandparents. And you've got to think, you know, when the kids get married or the grandchildren are having parties or anything, can I be in the same room? And yeah, why not? There is nothing worse than friends who have been planning weddings that say, well, I can't sit mum oh, yeah. next to dad and dad's new partner's going to be there. So we've got to make sure they're not going to come into contact. And it's like a military operation to make sure, you know, their parents yeah. don't meet at any point during the day because then they're so worried about the reaction that might happen and whether that's going to overshadow their day. So, yeah, being able to work together moving forward and just be civil enough to be able to get through these big events because it's not the case that they just can't never see each other yeah. again you know, they're going to have to be, particularly if they've got children. And how long did it take you to get to that stage? That's something that clients yeah. often ask is, is I'll say to clients, you know, there'll be time in the future you've got to try and work together. And they're like, no, Pat, no. Do you, do you know what they're like? No, that's not going to happen. <laughs> so to give anyone watching an idea of sort of, because no one expects it's going to be instantaneous in most cases, I, I wouldn't imagine. So, uh, you know, was that a, quite a prolonged period of time for you? Um, no, I don't think it was actually, but that's, that was, I think, down to my determination that it wouldn't be. You know, I couldn't think of anything worse than, you know, kids getting married. Oh, we can't invite this mm-hmm. one, we can't invite that one. And my youngest son was 21, two weeks after our decree absolute came through. And we all went out for dinner together. That's the aim. That, that is <laughs> that is laudable. That is it. That is impressive. And, and, and it's, it's great credit of, to. It's to, a matter of sitting on your hands <laughs> rather than your put tongue. them round his neck. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. I bet. Um, so, um, in terms of um, talking about your ex partner or talking about any partners, what is it that a partner can do? To someone who's to support someone who's going through the menopause. You know, a, a husband or a wife or a civil partner, and they see that they're their spouse is, is going through this and start to recognise the signs, what what can the other party do? Well, often, you know, they don't recognise the signs, they don't understand the signs and the symptoms and all the rest of it. And it, even the person themselves might not understand mm. the signs. I didn't know I was going through perimenopause when I was getting divorced. And it's only years later looking back because, I mean, my mum, bless her, she was still on the pill when she was 60. So she didn't even know that she'd gone through menopause. Mm. So I just thought, oh, I'll be 60 by the time I go through it. But, you know, I was like, I must have been about 43 when it hit. And I always say to Bill, my new husband, how lucky he is, because we met, 
each other at 53, and I was well through it then. So I said, you know, you never had to put up with all the, uh, men you know, menstrual tension and horrible moodiness and everything. What would you have liked, you, if, you, if it had been recognised at the time, looking back, is there something that you would have liked your husband to be able to do, to have done, to support you? Oh, yeah. I mean, things like not moaning when you want to sleep in a separate bedroom and, you know, not putting it down to, oh, you know, you don't want you don't want to sleep with me anymore. Well, who wants to sleep next to somebody who's who's dripping in sweat? You know, it's disturbing for their sleep as well because sometimes you, you need to get up two or three times in the night and change the sheets or mm. change your clothing or whatever. It's almost not taking it personally yeah. when you're meeting your needs. Yeah. Um, you know, don't take that as an insult. Yeah. And, but it's knowing, it's talking. Communication is key to everything. You know, breakdown in, in, in relationships, 99% is down to breakdown in communication, mm. disconnection. And it's keeping that connection strong. And if you've got a strong connection, you will be able to talk about everything and anything. There's still a lot of stigma surrounded around getting help for mental health, counselling. What would you say to somebody that was thinking that it wasn't for them, they didn't need counselling, they don't need to speak to somebody? Well, if you think about health in general, if you don't make time for wellness, you've got to make time for illness. So if, you go, if you've got a physical illness, you go to see a, a doctor. If you've got something mental or emotional, counselling, coaching, anything that's going to help you to get over that patch. I think one of the most, sometimes the most frustrating things that, that, mm. that we encounter is when you speak to, when we speak to a new client and we always talk to them about counselling, have you explored things, you know, people want, to, you want to be certain that people want to go down the divorce route or they feel like they've got no other option. Quite often they'll speak to them and say, have you, have you thought about counselling? They say, well, I would, but my husband or my wife just won't do it. That, that's a really frustrating thing, I think, for them and, and for us to hear it. Um, is there any way you can, you know, how do you sell it? If, if you're going through this, if someone's watching this, listening to this and thinking, I really want to do counselling, but my, my spouse just won't do it. How do you, how do you convince someone to, to kind of work on things? Um, you don't need to go both together. It will, if one person can change, the whole dynamic will change. You know, you can't control what other people do. You can only control what you, you do yourself. You can only control your reactions to what's happening around you. And if counselling or coaching is going to help you to change your reactions, then, you know, why not try it? Is there, is there not an element with that of... Is that not excusing people's behaviour, though, to a degree, if you're saying, well, you know, he does this and I don't like it, but it's on me to change? I think that's potentially some of the resistance that might come back. It, de it depends what... What you look, what you're talking about. If you're talking about domestic abuse cases, mm. yes, definitely. I would, you know, I wouldn't even attempt, you know, to help them to go through counselling together if the if there's domestic abuse. But you know, if it's just disconnection or or anything like that, working on yourself can help you to reconnect. Is there not a risk that you work on yourself and then you think, oh, I'm much better than this relationship? <laughs> well, if that's the way it's going to go, yeah. then, you know, at least you've got something positive out of it. And let's say someone does decide that's it. I think the, the marriage is broken down. We need to move on. You're about to start the divorce process. What tips would you give? What are the key things that someone experiencing menopause symptoms with the brain fog about to go through the divorce obviously take the time and do, do things when they're ready but what else do they need to consider for their future for the present to, to help them manage what is you know it's a, it's a really difficult time for anyone a divorce is a difficult time but on top of all these physical symptoms mental symptoms what what techniques can you advise um, well if, first and foremost they need to get themselves some help so ask if the doctor is suggesting antidepressants or anything just say I'm not trying to tell you how to do your job, but I am going through perimenopause. 
and it's the hormones that are, are causing all these symptoms, please can I have hormone replacement? It can be really difficult though, can't it, as well? Because, I mean, I think you spoke earlier about some GPs don't really understand it. Mm. And if you go in and you start questioning them, and, you know, that they're, they're, they've diagnosed you with something, you say, oh, hold on a second, you know, I'm, I'm in this age bracket, these are the symptoms I've got, I think it's the menopause. Um, what would you say to women about advocating for themselves in those situations? Absolutely. Um, I mean, they can always go to, you know, go to something like um, Louise's clinic online. There's a, a really good app. Um, and I can't think what, what it's called at the moment, but I'm sure somebody will. I think we've got a link to it in the yeah. draw at the end. I think we can, we can certainly share that. I think getting that... Um, so getting that extra advice from other places yeah. can be and really key. In the workplace, setting up a, a support group, mm-hmm. you know, sort of, or a, a WhatsApp group, you know, I'm feeling like rubbish today. Anybody got any tips on it? So talking to other people in the same age bracket. I think fe- female friends, I mean, haven't gone through the menopause yet, but certainly going back to sort of pregnancy and, po- you know, postnatal depression and things like that having a group of women that are going through these things together yeah. that you can talk openly to is really really helpful it reminds me of when when my, uh, my wife was uh, pregnant we had our children we were members of nct groups mm-hmm. and there would be the whatsapp group for all the mums yeah, at yeah. three o'clock in the morning yeah, going, absolutely oh my god they won't sleep oh i've been feeding every hour <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah and and, and those are, uh, and meanwhile i'm snoring away being absolutely useless <laughs> but those extra support someone actually going through it at the time yeah so, but is that something that you had when when you were going through it? Because again, it, it, my perception is it is something that for a long time wasn't spoken spoken about. There was quite a lot of stigma. Did you have that support? Was it easily accessible? It wasn't at that time. It was a dirty word, menopause. Mm. You know, you weren't you know, menopause. What's that? You know, it's the same. You know, girls these days. My eleven year old granddaughter came to see me the other day, and she said. She said, oh, I'm a martyr to my hormones. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, teenagers, hormones, 40 to 50, hormones. But it's it's much easier now to talk about it. Whereas when I was going through it, who talked about mm. it? You know, you didn't dare mention it to to a man. Oh, my yeah. goody aunt. Those no. are women's problems. Oh, yeah. We don't talk about women's problems. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, not listening. La, 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 la. I think it's generally the approach. Yeah, I know. I, I gave a talk to um, a conference a few weeks ago in Ireland, and apparently one of the men was put a, a really nasty comment about shouldn't be talking about menstruation and menopause and va- vaginas and. Oh, is it because they find it uncomfortable? It's an yeah. uncomfortable topic. But yeah. I think, you know, what we're learning at the moment is we have to speak about these uncomfortable topics, whether it be mental health issues, depression, anxiety, menopause, postnatal depression, because if we don't talk about them, then people do find themselves in a deep, dark hole that they're not able to get out of. That's right. We shouldn't be brushing stuff under the carpet anymore. The more open you can talk about it, it helps other people to know that there's people out there and people willing to to talk mm. you know we don't want sympathy as i say before you know we want empathy we want people to understand what we're going through it all comes back to communication as yeah. you said before you know 99 percent of relationship breakdowns communication issues i certainly wouldn't disagree with that i'm sure no, you, I think you, that's you wouldn't absolutely either. correct it is the it's the it's the most common thing and you know a, a problem shared is a problem halved yeah it's, you know it's, it's yeah. kind of a trite saying but yeah. but it's absolutely true isn't it yeah i mean think about somebody going off and having an affair why they didn't talk about their needs and do you find that affairs are quite common uh, in the group of clients that you work with because presumably if you have a situation where libido drops and sexual needs aren't being fulfilled and then the partner feels like they're being ignored does that cause do you think that leads to affairs is that something that you've seen yeah unfortunately it's probably other than during pregnancy and, and early childhood years, it's the next most common age group for people to go off and have affairs. And is there something that, as women, we can do to help our partners through that stage? 
so that they're they're not feeling that they're not loved and that they're being sort of brushed to one side yeah i mean it's it's there's lots of ways to show somebody that you love them other than you know having sex so it's experimenting you might find a new position that you actually quite like long term or you know there's all sorts of gels and things that you can use to help so it is being inventive Mm -hmm. being you know trying new things but i suppose it's the communication as well because it's talking about that talking about experimentation talking about something to keep the romance alive but also comes back to what we were saying before about having a hug going for a walk along the beach Mm -hmm. it's starting to sound like a mills and boone novel now but you you know know, doing those things and working together or i've um well taking up new hobbies is something that i've known that um sort of older sort of friends of mine have started doing couples who start dancing together when they're in the 60s a sort of strictly effect that was you know i remember that was a big thing a few years ago so i I guess there's something about trying to find new ways to express your relationship and express your love for each other in in, in different different fashions yeah yeah bill and i sing in choirs lovely and it's 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 the the feel-good factor you know Mm. you you can rehearse together at home and you know sort of when you're there you're all breathing at the same time you're all sharing the same space i think shared interests are key again that's something that Mm -hmm. we'll see all the time in practice is where that you know this is what i do with my time and this is what he does with his time yeah and those that venn diagram doesn't intersect you know there's no crossover is there yeah there needs to be something you do have to have separate yeah friends circles but and separate hobbies and things but as you say Finding that intersection is so important. And so far as somebody who has just been through divorce, has just been through the menopause, they've obviously had a really difficult few years dealing with all of that. What advice would you give to them so that, you know, as far as moving forward positively onto the next stage is concerned? I think the first thing is to find their new passion, to find purpose, and then to look after themselves, make time for wellness. And I'm not talking about just health, mm-hmm. but 360 wellness. So looking at career, looking at finance, looking at um, building new social circles, support networks, and you know, as well as the health things, you know, looking after themselves health-wise. Yeah, that's really true. I heard something not too long ago, actually, that it was um, you become the five people a mixture mixture of the five people that you hang around with the yeah. most so take a look at your circle and then decide whether that's who you want to be basically and it was a really interesting um and take on it yeah absolutely do you find that um after the menopause women feel that they change what they look for in in friendship groups and in social circles that you're looking at a change of personality slightly in the rewiring of the brain yeah is that something that becomes quite common yeah, I mean, the rewiring of, of the brain is, you know, it's my time to shine. So it's looking for people that have got the same sort of outlook. You, you know, get rid of the toxic relationships, even if that's a family member. You know, if they're not ser- not serving your new purpose, because divorce isn't the e- just the end of a relationship, it's the start of the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. You know, let's design the life of our choice. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sue, for joining us today. You can find out more about all the work that Sue does supporting people going through a relationship breakdown at her website, divorce-doctor.com. You can find additional resources about menopause at balance-menopause.com, founded by GP and menopause specialist, Dr. Louise Newson. In the next episode, we'll be joined by Mr. Divorce Coach Tom Nash, as we look at how to co-parent calmly and navigate the challenges of blended families. So that's it for this episode of Stowe Talks. Thanks for watching. We hope you have found it helpful and informative. If you'd like more information on future videos, our podcast series and programme of webinars, head over to stowtalks.co.uk where you can sign up for our email list, as well as checking out our previous episodes and forthcoming events. And please do rate, like, share and review this video where you can. Thank you and see you next time.